the song When You Say Love by Over the Rhine begins with these lyrics. I'm thinking of a word that has been knocked up and overused. You could say it's lost all meaning from so much abuse. You could say that. Love can be a troublesome word. It's not exactly our fault. We English speakers have this problem when it comes to the word love, and love is our monthly theme for February. For example, one dictionary defines love as a deep romantic or sexual attachment. Well, sure, I like that. <laughs> but then we use that same word to talk about our feelings for pizza. Maybe that's accurate for you. I try not to judge. <laughs> or for music, or for TV shows. I love my spouse, and I love my kids, and I love the Indiana Hoosiers, and I love fishing. What exactly does love even mean? It can be a problem. In seminary, I, I studied ancient Greek, and I learned that in that language, there are lots of different words for love. There's agape, which is sort of a selfless love, like the love a person might have for their children or their spouse or for those in great need even. Thomas Aquinas said that a God meant to will the good of another. Then there's eros, which is usually defined as sexual attraction, but it can be more than that too. It's sort of intimate love in general, which Plato thought could be physical attraction, but could also be love of a person's inner beauty, a deep kinship with another person. And there's philia, which is the love between equals, the love we have for our friends, our siblings, maybe our colleagues. And finally, storge, the, the more generic term that we could use to talk about our feelings for the Philadelphia Eagles or uh, for pizza, for example. So agape, eros, philia, storge. But in English, alas, we are stuck with one word, love. And that makes it easy to overuse and abuse it and to make it always gushy squishy like on those little candy hearts. And it makes it important when we want to talk seriously about love, I think, to define just what kind of love or maybe what aspect of love we're talking about. The love we Unitarian Universalists center our faith on has at its root the belief that human beings are born bearing the image of the holy. That was historically, of course, in opposition to that brand of religion that teaches that we're all born sinful and repugnant in God's sight and require a human sacrifice for God even to be able to stomach us. To insist instead that all human beings are born with worth and dignity that doesn't have to be earned was revolutionary. In fact, it turns out that changing that foundational religious principle, going from human beings born sinful to human beings born in the image of holiness, changes just about everything. Sexuality can be seen as a beautiful part of the human experience rather than being condemned as shameful. And so we Unitarian Universalists, with our cousins, the United Church of Christ, developed the Our Whole Lives Human Sexuality Curriculum. And we at VUU offer age-appropriate courses from childhood through the lifespan about the human body and human sexuality. Beginning with love for this amazing human experience, rather than shame, makes it easier, not easy, but easier for us to practice real democracy in our congregations and in society at large. We don't need dictates from on high. All we need of wisdom, we believe, is found in the communities we create, communities like this one, and including folks who are here, but also those who have gone before to whom we still look for guidance. At our best, we are people who insist on the inherent worth and dignity of ourselves and of all people. That's the foundation for the love we proclaim as Unitarian Universalists. We hope not just to make our congregations places where this kind of love is the foundation, but to create a world in which love is increasingly the rule. What might that kind of world look like? A Chinese philosopher, Mo Tse, who was active in the 5th century BCE, wrote, When all the people of the world love, then the strong will not overpower the weak. 
The many will not oppress the few. The wealthy will not mock the poor. The honored will not disdain the humble. The cunning will not deceive the simple. We have work to do, it seems. This is the kind of love we preach and enact in liberal religion. The love that begins with positive regard for the inherent worth and dignity of all people. And because we believe not only in our worth and dignity, but in everyone else's as well, it results in work for just treatment of all people. Living out that kind of love is pretty often countercultural, because so many of our systems are built on the backs of vulnerable people. Marriage rights for LGBT folks was a long struggle. Transgender rights are a struggle. Civil rights for African Americans, a struggle. Basic human rights for migrants is a struggle. Women's rights, including the simple right not to be sexually harassed, are a struggle because the status quo benefits a whole lot of people. Love requires disruption of the status quo. Love shakes things up. Former UUA Unitarian Universalist Association president John Burens wrote, apparently love, as I and many religious progressives understand it, is dangerous. We advocate for love that surprises, disrupts, and alters the status quo, that expresses itself in diverse ways, that comes in rainbow colors. Those who want to preserve the existing social and economic order invest in prohibiting such love, end quote. It's not easy. The Unitarian Universalists in Knoxville, Tennessee know that all too well. In his book, A House for Hope, Burens, whom I just quoted, writes of that congregation. The sign said, everyone welcome. But this was the segregated South 70 years ago. White folks were gathering to form a new progressive church in Knoxville. Academics, union leaders, professionals, activists, students. Does that mean me too, asked the black man. It sure does, said the greeter. It wasn't a very large congregation, but Jim Pearson became a member. Soon the music director was another African-American man, Calvin Dash. Leaders of the Knoxville black community joined and a multiracial congregation was born. They helped to form an area council on human relations that began to offer summer camps where black and white children could simply play together and get to know one another. Church members volunteered. Often they had to move the campsite because the KKK put bombs in mailboxes or left threats. After the Supreme Court ruling in 1954, the church voted to take out a full-page ad in the local newspaper, urging citizens to support implementing school desegregation with all deliberate speed. Many of the local sit-ins to desegregate public facilities were organized at the church. When Martin Luther King Jr. was killed before the Poor People's March in Washington could happen, the church organized meals for the protesters. The congregation didn't stop at issues of race. Buren says, I served as their minister in the 1970s. When Knoxville gay and lesbian Christians formed a small metropolitan community church, no one would provide them with worship space, so we did. They met Sunday afternoons. Then early one Sunday evening, the front windows of the church building were shot out by young men in a pickup truck. They threw formaldehyde into the building. Our youth group was meeting in another room, but we cleaned up, we called the police, and we calmed fears. We didn't call the media. Few people would have been sympathetic. We just focused on staying open and hospitable." End quote. In July of 2008, the children of the Tennessee Valley UU congregation in Knoxville were presenting the play Annie Jr. when a man entered the sanctuary carrying a guitar case. Once inside, he pulled a shotgun from the case and opened fire. He killed Greg McKendry, who jumped in front of others to shield them. He killed Linda Crager, who was visiting the congregation to watch the play, and he injured several others. He left a note in his vehicle that said that his goal was to kill as many liberals as he could before the police got to him. His apartment was full of right-wing political books, including books by right-wing news celebrities. It's true that sticking with love in the face of hate, maybe especially in places like the American South, can come at great cost. But it's what happened next that leads me to tell this story this morning. 
the wider religious community, including congregations of faith, uh, houses of faith from all over the country and the world, came together to support the, the UUs in Knoxville. Again, these words are from John Buren's. The outpouring of love the Knoxville Church received from neighbors of all faiths and convictions helped the healing. Their conviction that love is stronger than death and more powerful than hate is not weakened, but deepened. So the sign is still there, everyone welcome. And the church really means it. Anyone who comes in peace is welcome. In response to the shooting, the congregation and the UUA teamed up to create the Standing on the Side of Love campaign. It was recently renamed Side with Love, a campaign with the stated purpose of harnessing love's power to challenge exclusion, oppression, and violence based on sexual orientation, gender identity, immigration status, race, religion, or any other identity. And so, out of unspeakable tragedy, was born a campaign that has Unitarian Universalists singing songs and wearing yellow shirts showing up on the side of love to speak out against hate and violence. That is the hard work of our theology of tenacious love. It's easy enough to call out injustice from our couch while watching MSNBC. I did that this morning. Not so hard, maybe, even to show up for marches, to carry signs and the like. But setbacks come. The work of love is not an onward and upward forever kind of march. And what will we do? What will we do when setbacks come? What will we do in times like these? We're called by our commitment to love, by our theology of love, to keep disrupting to keep pushing for equality and justice. And I see you, I see us answering that call. But lest we think we only take love out to the world, love with its tendency to disrupt and alter the status quo, love won't leave us alone either. I think we should never stop allowing love to challenge our own prejudices. It is too easy for us to dismiss the worth and dignity of people whom we think aren't maybe progressive enough. How are we balancing the work of justice with the challenge of drawing our own circles of love and acceptance as wide as possible? Frankly, I see the liberal religious community failing at this from time to time. Revenge is pursued rather than justice. Groups of people are demonized as a response to other groups of people being demonized. It isn't always easy to remember the teaching of Dr. King that hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. It's the hard work of a lifetime, I think, maybe it's just me, to be able to stand clearly in a position while refusing to dehumanize people who hold a different position. It's difficult to walk the fine line, remaining fierce and unapologetic in our defense of the most vulnerable while refusing, again, to dehumanize people who see things differently. No one who knew what they were talking about ever said the love we preach in liberal religion was easy. But I am convinced that in the long run, love wins. It claimed a little victory this week. I told you a while back that I joined Puente, Arizona, and a couple of colleagues as plaintiffs in a lawsuit against Sheriff Joe Arpaio specifically challenging the legality of his reign of terror via workplace raids that split up families and sent a lot of our neighbors into hiding. I learned a lot from being a part of that action. You have not lived until you've been deposed by Joe Arpaio's attorneys. <laughs> but this week, the courts ruled against Arpaio and awarded almost a million dollar judgment, and a lot of that money will go to Arpaio's victims. Eventually, yeah. way to go ACLU and way to go Puente. Eventually, love wins, I believe it. In these uncertain days, then, let us redouble our commitment to act out of a tenacious, gritty, justice seeking love in our congregation, in our families, as citizens of this republic. 
Let us remember to put that love into practice however we can when injustice is found. A joy to be doing it together. Amen.